Good morning, Reg readers. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever, whatever time zone you've got today. Uh, my name's Tim Phillips, and we are going to be talking about smarter networking for a smarter data center. We're asking the question whether your data center networking is its weak link. There's two people on the call today who think that perhaps it might be. So let's have a look and see who they are. So uh, you will be familiar with our old mate from Freeform Dynamics, the Dark Lord himself, Dr. Stapps, Tony Locke, welcome back. Thank you very much, Tim. As ever, it's good to be here. Well, this is something that's close to your heart, isn't it? You have been talking about this for quite a long time, and not everyone's been listening. Do you think they're ready to listen now? I, it looks so from some of the survey results we're going to be going through. Um, it's a really important area, but as you say, it's quite often easily overlooked. Good. Well, let's, uh, we're going to be seeing those survey results in a minute, and uh, as you say, they do show that this uh, topic's getting more interesting now, and uh, also that we can do something about it, and the man who's going to help us with what we do about it um, for the first time with the Reg, uh, Charles Sterling from uh, IBM. Charles, welcome. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, Tony. It's good to be here. Now, IBM System Networking is a bit of IBM. Well, I'm not familiar with it, and some other people might not be as well. So what does IBM System Networking cover? Sure. Actually, uh, IBM System Networking is focusing at data center networking primarily, uh, and especially at targeting at, at connecting servers and storage more efficiently. So what would we do at IBM System Networking is integrate the different bits and parts of the data center from storage, server, management, uh, and, 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 and use the network to glue all these elements together in an integrated uh, solution. Do you agree with Tony that this has been something that's been overlooked maybe in the last uh, 10, 15 years in the data center? I think so, yes. I think that very often it was looked as a different element of the data center, just like storage and just like servers were treated as separate elements. I think now it's time to look at networking as a, an element, integrating all of these elements together, and uh, it's time to look at a, a new design for this data center. Well, let's look at this in a little more detail. And first of all, Dr. Stats, we're going to have a look at some of your uh, survey results because what we're saying is the data center network may be its weak link, which is quite a strong thing to, uh, uh, to say at this point. Let's see if the data backs it up at the moment. Well, it doesn't seem so, Dr. Stats, because look at the top bar there. The network's reliable. There's nothing wrong with data center networks. Well, there's nothing wrong with data center networks today, although you can see that, that you know, the network is reliable if you take the you know, fives and fours, the strongly agrees and agrees together. Only just over 80%, and given that the fundamental importance of this, you'd have thought that maybe it might have been a bit higher. And you can mm. see right on the far side of the chart, the, the, the dark gray and light gray bars, you know, there are some people there who strongly disagree with this, or some who just don't know whether their networks are reliable enough or not. And that's part of the problem. Outside of the people who are really close to networking, um, the network's basically been taken for granted for the last decade. People assume that it's there and that it works and that it's good enough. Um, as we look down the charts, though, we can see that, okay, the network is reliable, absolutely. Most places, that's certainly the case. But as we go down, even the number who think that it can meet our current requirements, the numbers begin to drop off and the, the, the gray bars begin to grow. Um, when we get down towards the bottom where we can see, you know, will the network be able to meet our future requirements, but that the number who agree quite strongly um, or, or just agree at all, it's down to fewer than four out of ten. And those dark gray and black bars um, and light gray bars on the right are over 40%. So there's as many people who disagree as agree that in the future the network's going to be able to do what they want it to do. Um, now, we've got to bear one thing in mind with relation to this chart, and that's that it was a network survey. So there is the, the thing that you're very familiar with, Tim, a degree of self-selection going on here. So in mm. general, the case might be that there's a far more people out there who are IT generalists, maybe rather than networking or data center networking specialists, who have much less of a clear picture of what's really going on in their data center and how well they will be able to cope with the future. But even here, we can see amongst the people that did fill in the survey, there are worries about meeting tomorrow's demands. Mm -hmm. Charles, does this uh, accord with the reality that you see? I, I'm quite concerned to see that there's a, some don't knows in there as well as the strongly disagree. 
Well, I think that the data center is going through a, a very important transformation, and, and we'll talk about some of these elements uh, more, uh, pushing this transformation. But uh, I think that it's fair to say that it, the, the current network infrastructure was designed to meet a certain uh, data center and certain application model. And as this is changing, we also need to change the, the networking layer. But what I'm looking at more interesting here is that, you know, we prefer a single networking vendor for the entire network. You know, only a half of them, only half of the respondents thought this was this was agreed to, to this statement. And I think it's very interesting as as many companies have a dual vendor strategy for their storage, for their servers, for their uh, operating system. I think it's about time that people start looking into uh, what I, I believe has been greatly overlooked: the dual vendor strategy for the networking platform as well. Well, you're yeah, happy with that just as long as you're one of them, Charles, aren't you? I'm sorry? You're happy with that just as long as you're one of them. <laughs> Absolutely. No, but I think overall... So, sorry to interrupt him. There's one other point on this chart that's really important, and that's the very bottom bar, where the number of people who think that their network is too inflexible to meet their growing needs, again, more than one in five agree with that statement already today. And that's something that, given that most networks have been traditionally very, very static, it's interesting to see that so many are already recognizing that as being a challenge. Let's move on to the next slide and have a look at why some people aren't managing their infrastructure better. Why is it, Tony? Um, well, top of the list as ever, it's the, the old chestnuts that basically the skills. The people we've got, the skills we have, the sheer number of resources that we have available to us to try and do everything that the business needs us to do um, are limited. Uh, that's true not just in the infrastructure data center management of the network, but across the board. Um, but interestingly, as we go down here, we can see that nearly everything else that people think has a major impact in their ability basically relates to management. Um, and again, if you, if you remember what I just said about you know, networks have really been pretty static up until now, but with the advent of things like virtualization um, and the business trying to get more closely aligned IT with its business needs, and the business needs change very flexibly, very rapidly, the requirement on the network and the data center as a whole to respond quickly is changing. And so we can see here that the number of people who think that they need better management tools to help them keep up with this is actually recognized quite highly. And that's quite strange given that usually um, management is always reckoned to be a challenge, but to see it quite so widely recognized here is uh, relatively unusual. Mm, it's always been a bit of a Cinderella in our reg surveys, hasn't it? And uh, people think that uh, management is bad, but that's just because that's what management is. Uh, you know, Charles, do you think there's much chance to improve this? Well. From a management perspective and from a staff perspective, absolutely the, the, the uh, amount of complexity that the people in the management will have to deal with is, is, is a lot higher now than it used to be. Uh, we're working in virtual environment, we're working in mobile envir environment where, where uh, mobility of the resources is, is happens every minute in some data centers, right? And they increase the level of complexity and, and therefore the current skills that the staff the resources have or the current management tools that are designed in a static way uh, are not able to simply quote and, and, and follow that, that trend. Mm. Let's move on to the, the, the last couple of your slides. Yes, of course, Tony. Yeah. But people did actually recognize here one other factor, and that's to do with the actual infrastructure that they have currently deployed in their networks in terms of the switches that they have and the number of tiers in the network, the state of their data center network cabling. Um, you can see that across the chart here, you know, more than 20% in all of those um, infrastructure-related areas recognize those as being um, areas that could have a big impact on their, their ability to manage their data center networks well as it is. Um, and right at the bottom there, even running separate physical networks for storage and data is something that has you know, hit the visibility chart. Sure, so they are beginning to realize what the problems are. And so let, let's, if we look at what is stressing the network as well, to be more specific about where their problems are coming and what's influencing their plans to maybe change the network for those who are thinking about grades. So we've got four columns here. Tony, what, uh, what do we learn from this? Well, if we start off just looking at the two on the left-hand side there, so base bandwidth and latency to begin with, that I just tried to put together as latency. But anyway, bandwidth <laughs> and latency, two areas that are you know, 
pretty close to each other, at least in the minds of people who are not networking specialists. We can see that across the board here, obviously enterprise applications are recognized as being a big stress factor. That's just life. That's really what networks were put in place to deal with in the first place. But already you can see you know, quite closely behind them, virtual servers, um, as Charles talked about earlier. They're on the board. We know that data centers are using more and more of them. And they are already beginning to have a visible impact on the network and the way that it's managed. And we've talked about this in many other webcasts with the register readers in the past, where people with practical experience, they start off really looking at the server side of things, but quickly find that storage and networking really have major impacts on their ability to manage these virtual systems going forward day by day. And as we go down to the bottom there, we can see on that bandwidth in particular, video is already you know, rated as a big influence on stressing the network already. If we'd have asked this survey question even two or three years ago, you know, video would have been much further behind on that. Even VoIP is very high here on both the bandwidth and the latency side. Um, Moving across though to security, well again, enterprise applications naturally enough number one, but again, virtual servers right up there at number two. And if we move across to manageability, managing virtual machines, number one challenge. Even above enterprise applications that really the virtual machines are serving in the first place. It's, uh, some of these technologies haven't had very much time to be an asset before they've become a problem for us, have they, Tony? It just shows the, um, the pace of change that we have at the moment. Uh, this, this creates a new sort of urgency for these plans, if we have plans to upgrade the data center network, for these plans to become reality. Absolutely. And virtual machines, as you say, you know, the, the take-up of them has been extremely high. They're by no means ubiquitous across the board in every company. But they are growing in importance, and they're already having a major impact. And that's being recognized even down to the networking level, because as you try and live with these things day by day, networking is absolutely crucial. And one of the big benefits that virtual machines and virtual servers are sold on is the ability to actually change things very quickly. While that's true, you can move virtual machines around very quickly if you need to, although in truth, the majority of the register readers tell us that today their systems, their virtual systems, are still relatively static. But going forward, they certainly look to be moving things around more and more, but they've already run into the barrier that the networking side of that um, is inhibiting them, perhaps putting in even the degree of flexibility that they'd like to do today, never mind the amount that they know they're going to want tomorrow. Okay, final chart, Dr. Stats. Uh, the buying plans for 2011-2012, are you encouraged that uh, the reg readers are putting enough of the budget behind solving these problems? Well, I think that's certainly a question you're going to have to ask Charles. Um, but we can see here that, that already there's been a lot of investment in the, the, the server virtualization. Interestingly enough, there's even been a lot of um, investment in storage virtualization, network virtualization. Um, but perhaps the ones that surprised me the most from the results, you know, the dark blue bars on the left, is just how high the 10 gigabit Ethernet and the network monitoring and management tools answers are in terms of the already invested, as well as the light blue and the green bars next to them on the firmly planned and strong possibilities for the next 12 months. You know, those are frankly much higher than I was expecting. Um, there is, as I mentioned earlier, the, the probability that there's a degree of skewing here, given that the you know, people who want to answer um, a survey on networking are more likely to be interested in working in the area to begin with. So I suspect that the numbers for a broader community, if we actually did a random statistically valid survey um, out in the world, the numbers would be slightly lower. But it's still very clear that people recognize that they're probably going to be investing in the network management tools. They're certainly going to be doing more investment on server storage virtualization. And the whole network inside here, it's, there's money in there. Um, people have worked it out. They can see that they have to do it. Um, interestingly, though, there's still a lot of people that, that are not quite there yet. It's just that they're beginning to see the challenges, but they've not got the planning in place to buy it in the next 12 months. Um, but that will probably follow for the, the remainder of organizations, certainly in the year or two after that, I think. Mm, Charles, you heard Tony's question. Are you yeah. encouraged by where this budget's going? Well, absolutely. When we're looking at 10 gigabit Ethernet, this is relatively in line, uh, actually, we, with our expectation. Actually, we have market research that, that shows that we have uh, potential more purchasing uh, customer out there for 10 gigabit Ethernet. We tend to, to believe it's a brand new technology, but 10 gigabit Ethernet exists since 2002, and now we have kind of reached a point where 
there is a demand for them in the data center because of the applications and the processors are a lot more capable of handling more bandwidth, uh, the new CPUs and the servers and all that. So, so that drives very much a demand for, for 10 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, what we're saying, though, the first three elements here is, uh, of this chart I love very much because um, people, it, it exactly reflects the state of the business right now in the data center. People started server virtualization, and that is well on the way. And some, somewhere along that virtualization path, they look at storage and say, well, I also need to, to virtualize my storage so that when I move my virtual machine, you know, something has to happen with my storage so they, they stay connected to the same storage device. And, and now, people are starting to realize that, well, they need to do the same thing with a network. And this is very interesting to see that uh, the registered readers are, are considering investing in that area because this is uh, takes fundamental in order to have the full benefit and advantages of the virtualization platform. So now let's have a look. Because we, we asked Charles to come up with uh, a, a conceptual idea of where the problems are when his budget has to be applied and how to apply it. So as you can see, um, our uh, reshaping data center networks slide. It, it, it's, it's like a piece of modern art now, uh, Charles. You, you did a terrific job on this. But for the, the five areas that you identified where uh, paying attention to data center networks really pays off, can you just very briefly uh, sum those up for us, and then we'll go into each one in more detail. But if you can tell us why they're there in the first place. All right. Well, thank you for... Uh Complimenting the slide, I'll, I'll let your, your, I'll pass your comment to our marketing team here. But uh, I'm more of a technical aspect than uh, the artistic aspects of, of this chart. But what I like about it is definitely the the trend that we're seeing in the data center is definitely around system virtualization. One of the elements that that drives is network congestion. The fact that we can have virtual machine moving around in the data center has a significant impact on, on the network infrastructure. Um, the other element that we want to talk about that I believe is changing the way the, 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 the data center has to be designed is a traffic pattern, or, and that is very much driven by the distributed application. Basically, we move from a certain model of application to another one, and, and that is more distributed where the application will install on several hundreds or thousands of servers, and that has an impact on the network requirement that comes with it. And as we've mentioned already, network or virtual, uh, virtual mobility or virtual machine mobility is absolutely crucial. Now people are starting, although I agree with Tony, very few are doing it right now, people are starting to realize that in order to take, have the full advantage and take full benefit of the virtualization strategy, they need to be able to move these virtual machines around. So this is another element that from a networking perspective, we absolutely need to address. And finally, you know, the two last element here is the convergence. And in and, and the convergence, we're looking at it from a technical perspective, how can 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, act as a, as a way to consolidate a different environment, but also from a fact that we need to reduce the infrastructure deployed in data center. And I think this is tying down with the fifth element, which as we're reducing the uh, amount of infrastructure in the data center, we are working in a more, uh, we're addressing the, some of the constraint on the, on the energy side and the power that the people are able to use in the data center is less and less, and the cost is going higher and higher. So, so the last two points are really together and really saying hey, we need to do a better infrastructure using less equipment and, and therefore drive some uh, energy efficiency. Okay, thanks. Let's pull this diagram to bits now and go into those uh, parts one by one. And um, Both of you can explain to me exactly what people can do and uh, what they're going to get out of it. So first of all, if we look at the system virtualization, you, your metaphor for this is a north, south, east, west. So we pulled that yeah. bit of the diagram out. Charles, what's north, south, east, west about it? Right. This is, this is a... Uh, well, what we're trying to explain here is that in the data center, the traffic used to flow from a north-south perspective. And what this means is that the traffic came from the client on a PC somewhere and was reaching a server somewhere in the data center. So the, the, uh, the client was launching a request on an application running on one specific server, and that was crossing all the networking layer of that data center once. The server was processing the answer and returning back the answer to the client. So the, the, the stress on the network was only in a two-way or north-south was only 
when there's client roster requests, and when there's server reply back to the client. Um, and therefore, you know, that meant that the we, had, we ended up with three-tier type of architecture, data uh, network architecture, where we had access, distribution, core, and, and that worked very well in that model. Now we're seeing that applications are, are, di are acting differently, and we or we're going to talk about distributed application. But most of the traffic flow that happens in data centers is what we call east-west. right? And what this means is a server-to-server -server type of model. It's where one server communicates with another server. And the amount of traffic between these servers has significantly increased, actually so much that we believe it's now more, the vast majority of the traffic in the data center is happening between the servers or the server and storage, right? So it's no longer from the client to the server, which we north south, which we call north south, or it's more towards east west, where the server are talking to each other in order to compute an answer to the client, in order to format the video streaming in a, in a you know, with our smartphone that we like and all that. So. The east-west traffic is becoming more and more important, and because the data center has been designed with a north-south type of architecture, that causes tremendous network congestion, right? Because we are not able to handle with the current network design and the three-tier type of network design, we're not able to handle very efficiently the east-west type of traffic. Now I have the, the the diagram up here showing the difference between the client server to the server server model, and uh, you know it looks uh, pretty straightforward what the difference is there. But uh, Tony, is this something that applies to uh, across the board? Is everyone experiencing this? To some degree or another, they are. Uh, and if you get another example of how in IT, you know, we, we build systems for one thing, and then we end up using them for lots of other things uh, that <laughs> they were never really architected for in the first place. Um, but it was just convenient to carry on doing so, essentially until we stress them, until they break. Um, as Charles explained, you know, we started off with the traditional client server, where the client accesses a server, which then itself you know, usually went straight to disk contained within the server. Over a period of time, we put in things called uh, network storage, so SANs in particular, where we put these switches in place between the servers to reach those, that back-end data. But over time, these things called composite applications have almost grown up um, without being recognized as being as important as they are. As Charles said, you know, a lot of the traffic that, that now takes place inside the data center isn't between a person or even um, an individual application request and the data. It, it's between different applications passing information to each other to build up the final one so that's passed back to the user. Um, it, it's a case that you know, lots of business applications might want to go off talk to another business application to pull in an extra piece of information. They might even be going off-site to, to the web to pull in geographical information or perhaps some map information to, to, to make things you know, clearer to pass back to the end user. So this traffic that isn't directly between someone hitting the return key and back to them has grown you know, almost invisibly to a degree now but that it is becoming a major stress factor in that traffic area in the data center itself. But as we said, you know, reasonably unrecognized until now. Charles, uh, what does that mean um, we need to do? How do we need to change the architecture? I know that's a very big topic, but can you summarize it? Well, the, the importance I think that our people should be looking at designing the data center is to recognize what Tony just described, is that there's a lot more traffic between the servers themselves. So if you're looking at the data center's network design, we should not start from restructuring or refocusing on the core environment. To some degree, I almost agree that we should leave the core as is. It's doing just fine. Where we need to be focusing is increasing the bandwidth or increasing the performance at the edge, at the switch connecting the servers, right, or the switch connecting the, the, the storage device. Because that unit, that networking device now has to handle a lot more traffic and also has a lot more intelligence to deal with because now they, they can be different network coming into it. They can be virtual machine. They could be uh, different te technology for storage, like fiber channel over the Ethernet and stuff, stuff like that. So it's very important to focus if we're going to try to address that solution and find a, a, a way in the data center that can meet today and tomorrow's challenge in networking design. I think it's to not start at looking at the core. I think that might just do the job right now fine, but looking at the, the connecting point of these, net, of these servers of storage and focus at that network element. Now let's have a look 
at uh, the second thing he pulled up, which is really, that, uh, it, it forms a, a pair with uh, number one, doesn't it? Distributed applications is what we're talking about here. Absolutely, but I think what, what is important here is to underline the fact that low latency or the latency of the network is becoming more and more important. In the north-south type of model, when the client launched a request against the server and received the answer back, you know, the network latency, and network latency I mean the time it takes to move the information across the network, right, what had, had a very minimal role to play, right? Now, if you're taking that application and you distribute it across Ten, hundreds, or thousands of servers. Well, and the information will have to go across the network ten, hundred, or a thousand times, and that will have a significant impact on the overall application performance. So that's why it's very important when I'm saying we're focusing at the edge of this, at the networking device connecting the, the server or the storage. Well, if that if that networking device takes um, five times more time to forward information. You know, if you have to cross it only twice in the north-south type of model, it's not so bad. But if you have to cross that network element 50 times, now you can very quickly see that that will have an impact on the performance of your application. And, and this is where uh, having low latency switching or low latency networking device can have a significant impact on the application performance. And Tony, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that the um, uh, the architecture of the of the application as well as the data center can take a, a small compromise on latency and multiply it into a big compromise on service. Absolutely, and the interesting fact is that basically until now, people haven't even tried to measure you know, these sorts of things. So when somebody starts saying that an application is running slowly with a traditional application, it was not always easy to get everybody to agree on where the problem was, but, but there were ways to address it to work out the answer where the problem was. But now when there's so much interconnected traffic going between applications across the network internally, not in the north-south, but this east-west fashion, and it requires a different set of management capability and a different set of monitoring capability to just be able to track things down to work out well, where are our bottlenecks now. And where do we need to improve? So as Charles said, you know, people will not rip and replace their entire networks across the board in the data center. You know, that's something that you, know, you only do when you move into a greenfield site, when you're moving into a new data center. And that doesn't happen very often. And in these economically strained times, you know, it's something that people really try and avoid as much as they can until they absolutely can't uh, live without something new. So people will change piece by piece, but, but having the knowledge of where do we start to actually address this, what's the place where we can have the biggest impact first, is something that people now need to look at. Do we know so enough to, sorry, sorry Charles, go ahead. And it's not really about low latency for the switch itself, it's really to stress out that the, the latency will have an impact on the application performance. And, and we recently completed a project in, in London with the King's College uh, Biomedical Research Center where they're compiling DNA sequence. And previously that was taking them days to compile these sequence uh, among a couple of, uh, uh, among the servers, right, among the compute nodes. And we optimized the network, we optimized the infrastructure, and now they're able to do this within hours. So it's a question of saying, am I going to replace the entire network infrastructure, but I'm going to focus in areas where we need to have more performance, and that will result in lower latency, resulting in, in a better application performance. Hmm. Tell me, do we know enough? Do register readers know enough about the performance of their applications and how, this, uh, how they are seeing the, the problems of latency in their own data center? It's an interesting question you raise. We, we know from numerous surveys we've held with the registered audience over the course of the last two or three years that, that looking at end-to-end -end response times is not something that a lot of people do. Um, and as we saw from the early slides on the survey results here, it, it's actually recognized by people that they need better monitoring tools. So the answer to that is, is pretty much um, a concrete no. There are some people, obviously, who are better than others, um, but the most of the networking folks out there are still trying to get their networking and their monitoring tools you know, modernized enough to help them to deal with these new changes. Charles, do you agree with that? Yes, uh, I, think, I think it's a fair statement as well. The um, uh, latency seems sometimes to be uh, a mystery for many uh, customers, but I, I do want to stress out that the importance of having an efficient network will have 
a direct impact on the application performance. And, and it's not looking, or sometimes it's not looking at the entire network infrastructure, but looking at some area of the network where it can be optimized for a specific set of applications. And that's a really important thing that people have got to work out for themselves. You know, where do I start? You know, where can I get the, the, the biggest benefit straight away? And as Charles very correctly says, you know, it's really only the application response time that, that people are interested in. All of the you know IT work that goes in the background, well, that's just completely invisible. People only want the stuff to happen quickly enough for them. Now let's have a look at uh, one place where you have identified that there is. Uh, a problem, an emerging problem, and that's virtual machine mobility, Charles. Can you explain why you put this into your diagram? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the um, it, not too long ago, people were installing a new application right on a server, right? They would install the physical server, they would install the the um, uh, operating system, and install the the uh, application on it, right? They would never move that server, or very rarely. Now we're facing a scenario in a cloud environment, or in an environment where uh, they use VMware vMotion or Microsoft technology. They're able to move these virtual machines very easily across the network, and, and that is very good because now they have full flexibility. They have a lot. Of, they have a, a server layer that is very flexible, very dynamic, very mobile. But unfortunately, it has to deal with a very static, unflexible networking layer, and this is really preventing some of these customers to take full advantage of the uh, of their virtualization strategy and and that's why we're focusing specifically in, in finding networking solution that can address the fact that that server that operating system that application is not residing on that machine all the time but it can actually move across your data center or even across data center and we need to have a network that is able to understand and realize that and and, and cope with this uh, with this mobility and right now, the current network infrastructure, most of, our, most of the customers we're talking to are not able to handle that, that important difference in, 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 the, in the application model. Mm -hmm. Tony, this does not sound like a trivial problem. It's not. And again, it's something that you know, time after time on previous webinars when we've been talking about virtualization generally, has been very quickly identified as being a challenge for people. Um, we, we did it with the uh, Lancashire Constabulary last year where they came along were talking about how things were going and then when they started trying to, to move things around, you know, partly because it gave them better resilience, partly because they wanted to literally you know, be able to switch some machines off to save some of the electricity that, that was touched on uh, briefly earlier by Charles. Uh, but they found quickly that the network was something that was really limiting their ability to exploit this inherent um, mobility of the systems that they put in on the virtual side. And again, the survey right up front here showed this was a challenge. Uh, Charles, I'm going to move us on to the, the slide that you, you have here, your VM ready technology. So we've given you a chance because you've been such a terrific guest, we've given you a chance to, uh, yeah. to talk about your own technology. Yeah, so with your Thank generous. you very much. Oh, Thank you very nice. much. I appreciate it, that. Well, I think your readers and uh, the, the registered reader will appreciate that as well. The, the fact that VM Ready is, is a solution that, that was introduced about in 2009 and really uh, tried to address the, the problem that Tony and I just described here. And basically, we're recognizing the fact that we've not, we, stopped, we need to stop looking at which is being a port or 48 port or 96 port switch, but that could potentially be a thousand port switch or 2,000 port switch. And what we mean by this is that when you connect a server to, the, to a switch, to an IBM system networking switch, it will automatically detect that this server is actually hosting, let's say, 10 virtual machines, right? And it will automatically create 10 virtual ports. So each virtual machine are connected to a dedicated virtual port. So now from a networking perspective, your network administrator can go and configure that virtual port and say, well, that's my accounting server, and it belongs to this VLAN. It has these security parameters. And define the entire network characteristic that we typically do on a physical port, now we do on that virtual port. More interesting is that when you're moving that virtual machine from one physical server to another physical server, the virtual port detects that and moves, the switch automatically detects that and moves the virtual port across uh, to, to wherever that virtual machine is now moved in the data center. So that means that your virtual machine is always connected to the same virtual port and always has the same networking characteristic. So that gives you the full flexibility uh, to move your virtual machine around. 
Tony, this is going to have to become the de facto way in which uh, virtual uh, virtual machines are managed, surely, isn't it? Automation is really important. Um, we saw again one of those early slides uh, where people pointed out that the access to enough skills and, more importantly, the number of people they need to do all the tasks that they're now faced with, you know, that's a major constraining factor on how they can run their data centers today. So anything that automates repetitive um, operations that are going to happen you know, time after time after time. The network, as we said, it's no longer a case of you can set it up and forget about it until it breaks or until you need to change something. And now that change is going to be happening you know, day after day, um, even potentially hour after hour, perhaps even minute by minute. So automation becomes certainly fundamental to the way to take things forward. Without automation, you know, a lot of the potential advantages that the new IT systems can throw up are just not realizable. You've often uh, commented, Tony, that when there's blame to be shared around, we do end up blaming the network guy. Um, it sounds like there, uh, there is quite a lot of potential for blaming the network guy in this situation. Uh, there's quite a lot of potential for blaming the network, not necessarily the network guy. You know, that comes much more down to interpersonal relationships. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fair point. Um, but I mean, this is this is I think uh, uh, Tim, you, men you mentioned the distributed de facto uh, for for networking, and we do believe that that yes, we the network of the future or today, uh, any customer doing a handling of virtualization projects should be looking at a virtual network as well. And the, uh, while VM Ready right now only works with the IBM system networking switch, uh, we're making this part as an industry standard called uh, 802.1 QBG, which is not the most Attractive marketing name here. I, 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 would, I, would, I would recommend you find another name for that one. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's actually the, the industry. <laughs> but that's actually the, the 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 main advantage of this, besides the name, is the fact that uh, other industry vendors, so other switch vendors, networking vendors, will be able to develop some uh, implement that standard and that protocol, and that customers will be able to move their virtual machine across their infrastructure, even if it's not just an IBM system networking switch. So the idea here is to have this as open as possible so that the data center does not have to be built only with IBM networking or with a specific vendor uh, product. We want to make this uh, an, open, uh, an open environment so that the customer can choose whatever vendor they prefer for a specific task and rely on the standard and the protocols, uh, the standard protocol to, to exchange that information together. Tony, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Openness against proprietary uh, technologies in uh, the network, in the data center. Uh, how important is that, do you think? It's very important. Um, time after time when we are surveying the register audience and when I'm talking to IT people generally, you know, one of the big almost subconscious fears is that being locked into a system so that once it's in place, you're stuck with it, you can't change, or you're stuck with just one supplier. People want things to be as open as possible to give them the choice um, to, to change things as they go forward. And that's something that you know, some vendors actually recognize quite clearly, that the more open they are, then frankly, the easier it is for them to sell something in the first place. Um, never mind that, that it helps keep people on board. But making systems as manageable across the board as possible has been highlighted by the register audience in the surveys we've carried out with them over the course of the last two or three years as something that they're really very sensitive to. They know that, you know that they've got multiple systems inside their data centers, whether we're talking about the networking side or the servers, the storage, um, the application stack, the virtualization levels. But they, they want things to be as open as possible just to give them as much choice and flexibility as possible so that they can make things as good for their business as they can. Now, I have a feeling that's not the last word that we'll ever be having at the register on virtual machine mobility. But let's move on to uh, uh, another can of worms. And actually, there it is in the diagram, the big can at the front. Uh, we're talking about network convergence. Charles, why is this in the diagram? Well, uh, yeah, the, the, the idea is that here we, we're looking at a data center, and it's very common to find different switching vendor, different switching technology alternate, right? And all these switching technology use 
uh, different management tool, often have different people to manage them. So, so we often end up with fiber channel, for example, for server to storage communication. And we often use InfiniBand for server to server communication because of the low latency. And we often find an Ethernet switching fabric for client to server communication because it's relatively inexpensive and it has uh, a lot of people know how to use Ethernet, right? So we end up with fiber channel because we want a lossless uh, for the storage. We ended up with InfiniBand for low latency. We ended up for uh, Ethernet for low cost. And, and, and I think the time has come to say, hey, well, these different switching technology needs to converge over a single switching technology. And when we're looking at this, 10 gigabit Ethernet transform itself to in a way that it's now able to address the low latency that InfiniBand used to have. It has it transformed itself, most importantly, in, to become a lossless Ethernet. Right? And by lossless Ethernet, what we mean by this is that it, it becomes an efficient technology or switching fabric to carry some storage without dropping any packet. In the past, Ethernet was the best effort type of technology. So I would send the uh, information on an Ethernet wire. If it reached a destination, fantastic. If it didn't, well, the application would let us know and we would resend it. And that wasn't a big deal. But in the storage environment, we do require to have a lossless environment. So that means every information that is sent across an Ethernet wire has to be guaranteed delivered at the end. right? And now Ethernet with lossless uh, Ethernet is capable of handling that. So the idea here is to look at the data center and say, well, I have three different, often I have three different switching fabric with different management tools, different people to manage them. Now it's time to look at converging them into a single switching fabric. And we believe that 10 gigabit Ethernet is by far the technology that is able to do that. Tony, I mean, we've had these different technologies within the data center, as Charles points out, because they were built for the purpose for which they are being used. I would imagine a lot of people listening to this will be thinking, are we really ready to converge at the moment? Is the technology it's a there? Question. And essentially, in particular, the, the, the guys looking after the storage networking have traditionally been you know, very, very conservative. You know, they, they had fiber channel because you know, that did exactly what the storage needed. It guaranteed that, that what you tried to save got saved. Um, but it's interesting as we go back to those buying plans that the registered audience filled in for us on that survey a few weeks ago, that even there we can see that almost 20% either have network convergence, fiber channel over Ethernet, et cetera, either very firmly planned or a strong possibility for next year, and an even larger number saying there was some possibility of it. So even that really conservative, you know, audience that, that wants to be absolutely certain that whatever they do is going to work first time. They're not going to have to struggle to keep things working, do lots of you know, clever stuff to, to get it implemented and operational day by day. Even now we're seeing that people are picking up on this and they're saying, OK, right, for some of us, it's time to look at this and change. And and Tony, you, you, sorry, Charles, yes, go ahead. Sorry, Tony, you mentioned SCOE as a convergence uh, protocol. So fiber channel over Ethernet is absolutely a newer protocol, and it's something that a lot of people are looking into. Uh, but you know, I don't think we should limit the discussion to only SCOE, because networking convergence can happen with iSCSI, with network attached storage. And I think people need to look at the performance and the, and the quality of 10 gigabit Ethernet being lossless now uh, as also bringing a lot of benefit for any iSCSI or NAS deployment that can happen out there, and also to SCOE, of course. But I wanted to point out not only to SCOE. Absolutely. And it's also interesting to see that, that as you move down into smaller and smaller organizations, the familiarity with things like fiber channel generally it generally drops off very, very quickly. And so Ethernet networking, people in the broader IT community are much more comfortable with and IP, TCP IP in particular, the protocol that run over that, they're much more comfortable with. So this convergence is something that, you know, it's not going to set the world on fire overnight and take over overnight because well, people just don't change their networking infrastructure that quickly. But we can see that, you know, this convergence is happening already. And people are comfortable that what's out there is good enough for them, at least a certain proportion of the people, and a non-trivial non proportion of the people are ready for this now. Tony used to be in charge of a data center. If you were still doing that job now, would you be making plans to converge these networks in the next 12 months? I'd be looking to where would it be appropriate for me to 
converge networks in, in the next 12, 24 months. Now, it might mm -hmm. not be everywhere overnight, as, as Charles said and as I said. You know, people don't rip and replace their data center networks in one go. You know, if you're building a new data center, fine. But if you're not, then you, you keep it. But you make change you know, slowly, steadily over a number of years because you know, this is stuff that once you've implemented it, it's going to be around for a long time. So it's certainly things that I would be investigating and working out, well, where do I start? You know, how far can I go? How quickly can I go? There might still be some things that you want to run independently with their existing fabrics for a whole variety of different reasons. But, but looking at convergence now and where does it fit it is certainly um, a productive use of time. Mm. Let's have a look at the, uh, the, the, the virtual network uh, fabric architecture against the traditional networking slides. Can you explain how this uh, how how this will be seen in the data center? Sure. Well, actually, you know, it's very surprising when you walk into the data center and you pull a, a server out of the rack and you look at the amount of cables connecting that server. There's a power cable, of course, but you know, there's typically several networking cables as well. And you ask the question, what is, what is this all about? What, why is Clever engineer, you know, and system administrator come up with a design that would have eight, ten, twelve, and I even seen sixteen cables coming out of a server, networking cables, right? And you start asking the question, and you say, well, I need to have a network adapter dedicated for uh, my production environment, and I need to have a networking adapter dedicated for my backup. I need another one for the management, and and so on, and, and another one for storage, and so on, and so on. And you often uh, you put all this redundant, you know, you put two of them for redundancy, and you often end up with with eight cables coming out of the of, of the server, and, and 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 that can be a very bad <laughs> that can be a very big problem because if you have 40 servers in a rack with 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 uh, uh, eight cables each, you know you'll have what three 320 cables coming out of the rack of that cabinet, right? And so first of all, you, there's a big cable management issue. You need to manage these cables. Uh, if you put them under the floor, then you might have some airflow problem because that takes a lot of space. And, and we ended up with these different network, one network for one purpose, because this is what the application guides typically uh, recommend. You need to have a specific network for your backup, a specific network for your management, and so on. So we looked at this in a different way and said, well, we need to respect the fact that the application requires a, a dedicated network adapter. And therefore, we designed what we call the virtual fabric architecture at IBM, which basically uses a network adapter that will emulate up to eight network adapter to the application. So from an application perspective, they also see you know, a dedicated network adapter for storage, another one for production, and so on and so on. But that network adapter in the server talks to the switch. And this is an example where I, when I was talking about IBM system networking tightly integrated into a solution, the switch and the server talk to each other. And now the server is telling to the switch and say, hey, I'm not a 10 gig port anymore. I'm actually four adapter. Right? And the switch automatically create four, six, eight uh, adapter, whatever the server is telling them. Right? So the end result or the benefit is really clear is that instead of having eight cables coming out of the, of the, of the servers, we're able to put a, a, a dual 10 gig adapter on the server, so only two 10 gig ports coming out, still respect the application requirements to have a dedicated network, a network port for specific function, but we result with much more flexibility in the bandwidth, so we have 10 gigabit that we can carve up the way we want, right? And this is very important because some of the application, some of the production traffic might require more bandwidth than the actual uh, uh, management port, right? So we are able to have a much finer granularity in how we want to carve up the, the network environment, and more important, reduce the, the, the amount of cable. And if we say remove, uh, reduce the amount of cable, if we are, instead of using two switch, instead of using eight switch ports, and we are only using two switch ports, well, we take less space, we need less uh, networking equipment to connect these servers. And this is really very important. And, and you know, we're going to talk the next point about the energy efficiency. I think this is very important to realize that if I have eight cables coming out of my server, I need to have eight switch ports somewhere to, to, to connect them. That's, that takes space, consume power, generate heat, and all that. So we're trying to reduce the amount of infrastructure by using smarter solutions between the server and the network.
And that mm -hmm. change of the cabling, Tim, is something not to be underestimated. I mean, with the second slide, you know, why aren't you managing your infrastructure better? We had there more than 20% of people stating that the condition of their data center network cabling was a challenge. But one thing that the Charles didn't mention, and that's that when you've got eight cables coming out of the system and you maybe want to change one of them, how can you know you're changing the right one? And anybody <laughs> who's worked in the data center you know, is very aware of how easy it is to accidentally remove the wrong cable. Um, we've all done it. Yes, it says getting four, four, four times less cables and space, Tony. You wish you had that when you were uh, you were in charge of cabling. It was a long time ago, but yes, it would have been nice. Yeah, the, from what I've seen in uh, data centers, the problem hasn't gone away just yet, but, uh, has it? So, in, in a very on a very practical basis, somewhere where you can have a, a, an immediate impact. So let's get on to um, part five. Yeah, Charles, the last one that uh, yeah. the, the last one that you identified, and this really follows on from a lot of the things that you raised uh, in, in the it, well, it, in all of the the previous things we talked about. Energy constraints. I mean, a lot, absolutely. So a lot of people look at the data center and either they're maxed out on the amount of power they can use, or, or either the price of the energy is, is is so expensive now that it has a significant impact on their operational cost, but. But I, I want to bring the attention to, you, to your audience here that it's not fair to be looking at you know, the, uh, consume watt per port on a switch and say, well, you know, my switch consume five watt less than this switch and therefore it's a better energy efficiency. Uh, 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 to some degree, it is. Absolutely, I agree with that. But I think more important is what we need to do is look at, have a holistic point of view here and say, where can I reduce my energy uh, and uh, being more energy efficient? I mean, so one of them is absolutely by virtualizing, right? Virtualization. The other thing is converging the switching fabric. We talked about, uh, you know, having fiber channel and CD band and Ethernet as uh, different switching technology. Uh, well, now if we remove two of these switching fabrics to only keep Ethernet in a more efficient way, well, we just save a lot more energy at that point. We just talked about consolidating, consolidation of the cable. So it's about converging and consolidating. We, we, we would have needed eight switch or eight switch port to, to connect that server. Now we only need two. And I believe that these are the real saving on energy that your customers and your readers will, will, will appreciate. And Tony, the, we, we, we end here almost at the beginning because, as we know, there are a, lot of, uh, a lot of our reg readers who would plan to expand their data center, it doesn't matter how much money they've got to pay for the power, that power is just not available. There are certainly locations around the world and places in London where it's almost impossible to get extra electricity pumped into your building today. And you might be waiting until the end of next year, possibly the year after, before any of the power companies are willing to provide anything to you. And interestingly, of course, if your organization is one of those really large um, consumers of the electricity, then all of the sort of carbon footprint taxing that's coming in is going to have an impact there. You know, whenever we've surveyed the register audience um, in the past, um, energy considerations and, and green have always been reasonably low on their list of priorities, um, but they've been almost a, a collateral benefit. And for some people, that's very much not the case. But the people that Charles is talking about, you know, who can't get enough, then they, they, they need to find different ways of doing things. But as the overall taxation regime changes and makes energy consumption more expensive, just from purely a taxation point of view, never mind the fact that the, that the whole energy costs are going up and up and up anyway, um, it's likely that we're going to see even more attention being paid to energy usage going forward. We, we know that a lot of the um, people running IT today are not actually responsible for their, their electricity bills. You know, it's what Douglas Adams in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy called an SEP, somebody else's problem. Um, that's beginning to change. Uh, when I asked an audience you know, five, six years ago about this, you know, maybe one hand in a hundred went up to say they even had any idea how much their electricity bills were. You know, that's changing. It's changing slowly, but, but the rate of change is increasing um, quite fast now. And the chief financial officer is reminding them how much electricity they're using, I guess, isn't it, Tony? Well, well they, they are being asked to, to, to prove that they're doing as well as they can be. Uh, but again, yeah. if they've got the monitoring tools in place to actually do that better. Mm. So let's just put these five all back together again in our diagram, looking at reshaping data center networks. 
On um, the IBM's proof points that you brought in there, Charles, some of the effects, if you're, if you're willing to back these up, some of the implications of uh, giving attention to the data center network are quite dramatic. We're not talking about squeezing an extra 1% or 2% out here, are we, Charles? No, absolutely, and yes, we can support these claims, absolutely. Uh, the important here, the importance is about integrating the, the network into the, the proper context, right? And I think for way too long, we have been looking at network as a different discipline of the data center with different people and different mentality. And as you can see from these, uh, from these uh, performance here and from these, these proof points, by integrating a network and having them, doing it in a more efficient way, in, in a more smarter way, in connecting the server and the storage together, we're able to achieve some great benefit to customers, right? So it's about integrating network into the solution because at the end of the day, it's about the application performance. It's about having an integrated management. It's about having a system, a solution that works together and not having different elements, server, storage, and network handled separately, but it's really to glue all of this together and, and, and you know, we can achieve some of these benefits that we're showing here on this slide. I, I knew you wouldn't take the results for us, Charles, but in, in the couple of minutes that we've got left, uh, but for both of you, uh, will, when we have a look at the, uh, while we have a look at the further reading slide, is there something that you would pull out as a good place to start? It's one thing to know that you've got another, a problem, but if you wanted to start this morning or this afternoon on fixing it, where do you go to first? Tony, that one for you. Um, I'd say that if you can, try and get some good information on where are the bottlenecks inside your system, but also, you know, what do you find internally to be your big challenges? You know, is it that you want to do more movement of virtual machines? And um, is your data center cabling such that you're really you know, got too many problems there to, to, to risk making any changes um, of networking? Is it that your whole management and monitoring tools are just not up to scratch? It's really working out well, where are you to begin with, and then you know, take it from there. Mm. Charles, what do you think? Where should we be starting? Well, Tony actually <laughs> touched a very good point here. Uh, I, I do want to stress the fact that the application most of the application, we're looking at high performance computing, we're looking at a web 2.0 type of model, or we're looking at smart analytics type of environment, all have a distributed type of, 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 of application model, right? So looking at how the interaction happens between these applications and where are these applications spread across the infrastructure and how we can increase the bandwidth, the performance at that Connect, network connecting point will have a very significant impact on, on, on the application performance. So it requires a little bit more work. I must admit you know, that it's not as easy as saying, I'll oh, just change all the switch and, and, and everything will go faster. We need to sit down and understand uh, you know, how the server storage application works together and come up with a networking design that is specifically optimized for that type of environment. And that usually, you know, without a massive investment, translate into a very good benefit for the customers. Uh, and Charles, it can be a policy of continuous improvement. You can uh, work on this gradually, upgrading uh, elements of the system a piece at a time. It doesn't have to be one of those enormous, huge no. infrastructure programs where everything has to stop for two years while you fix the uh, data center uh, network. Uh, absolutely. And as I mentioned, when we talked about the north, south, east, west type of traffic model, the core is often powerful enough. It has enough resources in the networking environment to, to, gener to handle the client request. Where we're seeing networking congestion, it's because of virtualization. It's because of uh, convergence with FCOE and technologies like that that requires a ha a more bandwidth at the network point connecting the servers. So that means that from a you know, uh, strategic point of view, you can leave the current infrastructure in place and focus at optimizing areas where you would take full benefit of the uh, 10 gig or even 40 gigabit Ethernet. Thanks. And well, our time is up. So, Reg Readers, this is your job. Off you go and upgrade your data center networks because uh, it seems that there's good reasons to do so. And uh, make sure that next time we survey you about it, tell Dr. Stats what's been going on. You'll make an old data center manager very happy if we get some success out of this. Is that, is that, is that fair, Tony? Absolutely. You know me too well. I, I called you old. I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to. It just slipped out. Uh, that's Dr. Stats. As well. 
<laughs> You've seen too much, Dr. Stad. But thank you very much, uh, Tony, for, uh, for your contribution today. And Charles, thank you very much for taking us through all of that. Um, we hope that's been useful for you. And uh, so tune back in for our, our next RegCast. Uh, but for me, Tim Phillips, goodbye.